So this Shabbat morning, we're going to do some learning, and we're going to talk and think a little bit about gratitude. So we'll start with looking at the Hebrew term for gratitude. Some of you might know it already, hakarat hatov. And so this literally translates to recognizing the good. So I love this definition because it helps us understand that gratitude, in a way, is very simple. All we have to do is recognize the good. It's simple, but it's not easy because there are so many moments in life, so many situations in life when what is good seems to be invisible. Oh, it's also interesting, I think about this a lot, how gratitude is popularly recognized to be good for you. I was doing like a 10 second Google search on this earlier this week and found the, the phrase from the Anxiety and Depression Association of America that says gratitude is a mental health game changer. So this is, this is very trendy and it's very good for you. But in our parasha, gratitude is not a trend, it's an obligation. And the consequences of not being grateful are dire indeed. So we read in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verse 47, because you would not serve the Lord your God in joy and gladness over the abundance of everything, that is, because we weren't grateful, we didn't recognize the good, the consequence is we will have to serve in hunger and thirst, naked and lacking everything, the enemies whom the Lord will let loose against you. So whether gratitude is a good mental health move or a swerve around God's dire consequences, I think I'd recommend it either way. Now we read at the beginning of this week's parasha a particular instruction, a technical instruction, and in how to express our gratitude. And what's very interesting about this text is that not only does it show up in this week's parasha, it shows up in our Passover Haggadah. Now, if you're remembering Shabbat services here last week, we were studying last week's parsha and connecting it to Purim. I think it's very interesting that this week there's a connection to Pesach. Maybe there is some sort of very, very creative drosh about how we're viewing all of the holidays in advance of Rosh Hashanah. But I think it would be more accurate to understand that the book of Deuteronomy, this fifth book of our Torah, is hugely influential in Jewish tradition. It has the Shema in it. And its verses and its teachings show up everywhere in Jewish tradition, even when you least expect it, like in the Haggadah. So speaking of our Haggadah, let's turn back now to our parasha and to this, this text that we find in the Haggadah. So we read at the very beginning of our parasha, chapter 26, verses 1 through 4. When you enter the land that Lord, the Lord your God is giving you as a heritage, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of every first fruit of the soil, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You'll put it in a basket, and you'll go to the place where, where the Lord your God will choose to establish God's name. You shall go to the priest in charge at that time and say to the priest, I acknowledge today before the Lord your God that I have entered the land that God swore to our fathers to assign us. And then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. So this is about gratitude. We're already recognizing the good here when we follow these instructions. We have our first fruits. We're recognizing our produce, our prosperity. And we're also acknowledging that we have entered and are living in our promised land, our holy land, something to really be grateful for. So that was the introduction that we, that we read in this week's parasha. And then we get to the verses that we find in our Haggadah. This is Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 5 through 8. And so we're going to spend a little time unpacking this first verse, which is, you shall then recite as follows before the Lord your God, and I'll say this in Hebrew first, Arami Oved Avi. So Arami Oved Avi. This is actually a very interesting phrase. There are two different interpretations of this. There's the one that we'll find in our Humash, which we will talk about a little bit later on. But first, we'll focus on the interpretation found in our Haggadah. So in our Haggadah, in case anyone happened to bring a Haggadah with you to services, or if you have a Haggadah and you're following a lot at home, you can turn to it, and you can see it's translated as, an Aramean sought to destroy my father. So this interpretation is understand the word ovade to be a verb, meaning to lose or to destroy. The subject of the verb is Arami. The Arami is the noun doing the destroying, and the object of the verb is Avi, my father. That is the noun receiving the action of the verb. So who is the Aramean in this interpretation? Who is the Aramean that sought to destroy? And who is Avi, my father? So as the interpretation in the Haggadah goes, the Aramean is Levan, brother of Rebecca, our, our matriarch, father of Ra Rachel and Leah, our matriarchs, and my father in the verse is our patriarch Jacob. 
Laban is one of our ancestors, and he did seek to destroy Jacob by keeping Jacob bound to his household, not quite imprisoned, but let's say bound. Had Jacob not separated himself, he would not have established his own household and become our patriarch. Thus, Arami Oved Avi, Laban sought to destroy Jacob, yet Laban did not succeed. Now, all that's just our first sentence. So now we continue, and we find these verses in our, in our parasha and in our Haggadah. Our ancestor Jacob went down to Egypt with meager numbers and sojourned there, but there he became a great and very populous nation. The Egyptians dealt harshly with us and oppressed us. They imposed heavy labor upon us. And we cried to the Lord our God, the God of our ancestors, and God heard our plea and saw our plight, our misery, and our oppression. And God freed us from Egypt by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm, an awesome power, and by signs and wonders. So if you know this part of the Haggadah by heart, as I'm sure some of us here do, you'll remember that in between each one of these pasukim, each one of these sentences from Torah, there is study, there is commentary. It is very much the tradition in our Pesach Seder and in our Haggadah to expound upon, to explain in detail these Torah verses from our parasha this week. And in our Haggadah, we surely do expound. And at this point in our Haggadah's commentary on this verse, this point in our Haggadah, about how God freed us from slavery in Egypt, we crescendo into one of the most well-known songs in Jewish tradition, Dayenu. This song from our Haggadah is essentially a liturgical hymn of gratitude. Each line of the song lists something that we as a people are grateful for, and we say after each, at the end of each line, for just that one thing, it would have been enough. We would have had reason to feel grateful. And soon after that in our Haggadah, at the very end of the Magid section, for those following along in your own Haggadah at home, or here in Shul, this is right before we drink the second cup of wine, we read, we are obligated to thank, praise, speak well of, glorify, admire, honor, bless, exalt, and revere God, who did for our ancestors and for us all these miracles, who brought us from slavery to freedom, from sorrow to joy, from grief to celebration, from darkness to light, and from enslavement to redemption. Let us sing before God a new song, hallelujah. And then we burst out into psalms from Hallel, our liturgy that specifically celebrates joy and goodness. Our gratitude leads us to joy. And so that's how these verses from this week's Torah portion show up on our Haggadah. Now let's go back to the context in this week's parasha. We'll look at the selection again. We'll start with a different interpretation of that first phrase, Arami Oveda V, and we'll see how we still end up finishing with gratitude. So if you read along in the Eitz Chaim or any translation of, of the Tanah or the, uh, the parasha here, Arami Oveda V is translated as, my father was a wandering Aramean. Sometimes it, the translation will say, my, my father was a fugitive Aramean. So this interpretation understands the word Arami to be an adjective, meaning Aramean, and Oved to be an adjective, meaning lost or wandering. Avi again means my father. Our Eitz Chaim Torah commentary explains that this interpretation refers to the fact that the ancestors of the Jewish people came from a region known as Aram Neharaim, and that we became the people we are today when we were freed from slavery in Egypt and came into our promised land, the land of Israel. Now this interpretation of Arami Oveda V makes sense for the context in our parasha. We're reading the same text with a different focus. We're focusing on our holy land, the land of Israel, because part of expressing our gratitude for our first fruits is expressing our gratitude to be able to grow produce in our holy land. And so we read again in chapter 26, verse eight, God freed us from Egypt by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm, by awesome power, by signs and wonders. And we continue, and God brought us to this place, the Holy Land, and is giving us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I bring the first fruits of the soil which you, God, have given me. And that's the end of the phrase that the person is supposed to recite. And the instruction continues where I, in verse 10 of chapter 26. You shall leave the first fruits before your God and bow low before your God. And you shall enjoy together with a family of the Levite and the family of the stranger and the stranger in your midst all the bounty that the Lord your God has bestowed upon you and upon your household. Now, if you have the Eitz Chaim commentary, I really encourage you to look at the below-the-line commentary on verses 10 and 11. I love this part. It says, 
Gratitude and generosity do not seem to come naturally to most people. Most of us must be taught to remember to thank God for our good fortune and must learn from experience the satisfaction of sharing our bounty with others. Given that it's such a struggle for people in general to remember to be grateful, to remember to be generous, what a gift it is for us to have Torah, to have this instruction that we have to be grateful. And it's so interesting when we read these verses in our parasha and in our Haggadah, we start with the same verses and go in two kind of different directions and, and come back to a similar place. The Haggadah, the text of the Haggadah was written in the time of the Talmud. We were in exile from our Holy Land. The instruction to be grateful is to be grateful for our freedom. And we are grateful. We sing Dayenu and Hallel. And our parasha, our parasha in the book of Deuteronomy, in this narrative in the Torah when we're journeying towards and just about to enter our holy land, our parasha instructs us to be grateful for the land that we are being given, for its soil and for its fruits. Whether we're in exile or whether we're in our homeland, either way we're instructed to be grateful. This is powerful. It's the same instruction, even with this night and day difference. And also, in our Haggadah and in our parasha, we're not just instructed to be grateful, we're instructed to be generous. Our parasha teaches we must share with the Levites who do not have their own land and their own crops, and we must share with the strangers who happen to be in our midst. And our Haggadah, of course, teaches, let all who are hungry come and eat. It's part of our tradition. It's part of our Jewish instruction on how to practice gratitude that we should pair it with generosity not just to recognize the goodness in our lives, but to share it with others. Now, back to gratitude in popular culture. One of the things that is popularly said about a practice of gratitude, of making a habit of recognizing what you're grateful for, is that the practice works even better when it's social, when it's shared with others. So if it's good to write down five things you're grateful for every day, it's even better to share that list with a gratitude buddy, who will share the five things they're grateful for. If it's good to think about something you're grateful for while you're eating dinner, it's even better to speak about the things that you're grateful for in the course of dinner conversation. It's amazing that in this situation, the insights about mental health and wellness in popular culture are supported and are preceded by wisdom from our Torah. So today with all of you, I am grateful for the togetherness that we find in community I'm grateful for this physical sanctuary, our spiritual home. I'm grateful that we have prayer and words of Torah to sustain our souls, and even more grateful that we have bagels and salad and fruit and cookies to sustain our bodies. And most of all, I am grateful that we all get to have this experience together. Shabbat Shalom.